Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to episode 32 of MSP Business School. Uh, today, I'm really excited to say we've got a fun guest with us, uh, Abe Garver from Focus Investment Banking. And Abe does something that all of us should be thinking about no matter where we are in our journey as an MSP. He helps folks with mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, as a business owner, if you don't have at least in the back of your mind what the exit strategy is, you're missing a huge opportunity to really start setting the table today. And Abe's really going to share with us um, what MSPs need to be thinking about in terms of mergers and acquisitions and what the end game is going to look like for them. So I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us today, Abe, and welcome. Great. I greatly appreciate um, being a guest, Brian. Terrific. So. As always, in addition to Abe, I've got Rob and Tim joining me today from OSR Manage and my lovely co-host who, you know, keep things light and airy and keep That's me right. on track every week. Try to, try um, to. You know, so, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today and maybe Abe, what you can do first is tell us a little bit about Focus Investment Banking and, you know, what you're all about and some of the things that you've uh, accomplished thus far in the world of M&A and MSP. Sure. Um, Let's see, so Focus Investment Bank um, established in 82. We focus on the lower middle market, which we define as between transaction values between five and 300 million. Uh, and we deliver both, uh, we work for both sellers on the sell side and buyers on the buy side. Uh, I spend 100% of my time focused on MSPs. Uh, and am one of the most active MSP advisors in the country at this point. Um, as you know, kind of to, to, to kind of expand on that, this year um, Focus Investment Bank will be involved with, uh, depending upon how the year closes, eight to nine MSP transactions. And there were 10, uh, 10 MSP um, PE back platforms formed in the United States uh, during 2020. Focus was the catalyst for four of those 10, and uh, the fifth of the of the 10 we worked all year on the buy side for. Um, so if I can interrupt you there, maybe for our listeners who might not be, um, you know, in tune with that, what is a PE backed platform? Right. So once <clears throat> a um, once a MSP business hits a operational maturity level uh, that it frequently um, involves having kind of at least two million dollars of what we would call adjusted EBITDA or cash flow, when the business reaches that size and a high kind of operational maturity level, um, there are many PE groups um, around the country, around the world that, for instance, will raise $500 million and they will invest it in 10 different businesses, kind of in $50 million chunks. And a platform, MSP platform investment is one of the private equity groups taking $50 million and let's say investing 20 to acquire the MSP and then having a, a thesis and strategy for the next five years to buy add-on targets to, to grow EBITDA. Gotcha. Okay. So really taking yeah. that initial investment and building a portfolio around it and then using that initial chunk to, to get that executed. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. So tell us a little more uh, about uh, Focus Investment and you know building off of that. What else have you accomplished in the last year or two? Yeah, so um, our focus, my my focus within the firm, um, and there are 30 um, investment bankers like myself, we have a MSP team within focus within our IT and software group. Um, and we have we've been working, I think one of the reasons that helped us uh, become really successful is we started working for PE backed MSPs and PE groups that wanted to um, make their first platform investment. And once they made the investment, they wanted to start buying. And so in working on the buy side, uh, really for the past several years, we we now are in touch with about 1,800 MSPs and have had um, what I call target profile calls with about 350 of those 1,800. So, so we've, um, on behalf of buyers, uh, 
PE backed buyers have called and spoken with founder CEOs of these MSPs, learned about their business, um, reported back to our buy side client, um, and to the extent they're interested, um, we help facilitate the conversation and then take the MSP all the way through to, to selling. Um, I would say it's always um, a good idea for MSPs to take these calls um, from buyers, even if they don't get all the way to the close transaction, the amount that they'll learn yeah. um, from yeah, hearing sure. what the buyer is looking for can really sharpen their focus moving moving forward. So, Abe, I, what would you say are you know some of the top things that you are looking for when you're uh, you know doing these evaluations of an MSP to you know kind of make sure that they are like moving in the right direction, so to speak, for M and A. Right. So it's important, you know, some some of the things that we key in on um, right away, I'll go to LinkedIn, uh, the company's website and LinkedIn and see how many employees self identify and say I work for this this IT, this MSP, yep. this MSP. Mm -hmm. And that gives me a good idea of, you know, uh, kind of what revenue, what potential earnings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at what market they're active in. Uh, and then when we, you know, so we kind of do all the public research we possibly can prior to getting on the phone mm -hmm. with the MSP. And then we're spending, um, you know, 30 minutes or so um, asking key questions, um, including kind of where are from with your revenue, what percentage of that is recurring, um, what percent is project based and what what percent is, is more product. Um, mm -hmm. Are there verticals that you're focused focused on? Um, kind of what's the what's the historically kind of the trend with your with with revenue? Um, the recurring portion is you know is just really the most valuable piece. Uh, so really a lot of understanding <coughs> around the business that they're providing to their customers. Um, I would say there's a the, over this past year with COVID, there's become more of a bias on the part of buyers and investors to um, to invest in MSPs that are in, if we think of um, uh, small and medium, uh, small and medium size, the larger the the larger your clients are, kind of the better because the more um, all things being equal, resilient they are to kind of what's going on with you know with COVID. Yeah, yeah and, and that's a that's a real big consideration these days. Is you know size, scope, and industry really is dictating which MSPs are coming out of this actually winning and which ones are coming out losing in the process. And certainly those that have a heavy focus on, uh, I've seen at least hospitality and entertainment are really struggling to kind of retain those recurring revenues over time. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was actually going to be one of my questions is uh, one of the, what are some of the things that, that you found in 2020 just since COVID hit? It's been such an odd year for everybody. And Rob's cat is really interested in knowing what your answer is, by the way. It's <laughs> like he just wants to know left, right, and center. Yep. <laughs> COVID has surprisingly not, really, you know, except for the first couple months in March and April, um, COVID has not had a super large impact on valuations. And, you know, just kind of as you would think, um, you know, different verticals have been, their clients have been affected more. Yeah. But I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of MSPs really grow their recurring revenue through COVID. And their product sales and their um, their project sales both went down, but the buyers kind of shrugged their sh shoulders and said, "There's going to be, there's just pent up demand in the future. Um, as long as the recurring portion's growing, we're, you know, we love the business, and it's, um, it, you know, it's. I think MSPs have really shined um, very quickly. It's like, like I said, about a two month." Um, everybody kind of hitting the pause button and figuring out what to do. But, uh, you know, it's just been a ton of ton of activity with yeah. with PE buyers and their bolt-ons. 
Yeah, I think the MSPs actually saw a huge opportunity to get some stalled cl cloud projects moving with customers, obviously remote work ca capabilities, and more importantly, the security around that have been real hot buttons that have actually helped some MSPs flourish during these tough times as well. And uh, I'm sure you're seeing the same on your end. So with that, we probably want to segue a little bit into I'm an MSP. I'm thinking about my exit strategy. What should I be planning for? What are the steps that I can take? So, would you be able to share a little bit of that with us, Ian? Sure. So I think it's important to, you know, to talk to an M&A advisor. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's usually a, a, you know, I'd say within 30 minutes of, of talking to the right person, somebody that's done a lot of transactions recently, they can really help. Um, you know, we can really help just kind of focus you on on the key issues. Uh, advice that I've got to two companies that want to increase their their MSP valuation in 2021. Um, you know, I, I pulled the camera back after working on a bunch of these transactions this year and said, kind of if I if I could limit it to five, you know, five piece, pieces of advice. Um, what would those five things be? And and this is really what I came up with. One, um, I, there are 600 companies, there are 600 MSPs now um, in ConnectWise's peer groups. And those have just, when I work on transactions, the buyers want people that are in peer groups. Um, and there hasn't historically been a lot of geographic competition among um, among MSPs because they're in different geographies. So we really had, uh, it's a really nice friendly vertical to work in um, or sector to work in because each one of these founder CEOs of MSPs, really they really enjoy coaching um, their peers across the country. And what's resulted is we've gotten a lot of very high, high operational maturity level MSPs as a result of these peer groups. So the peer groups are great to increase OML and they're also great to find um, merger and acquisition targets with peers who um, kind of follow the best practices, probably have a similar tech stack. Um, so I'd say actually if you had one thing you were going to pick to do to increase your value, it's join, join peer groups. And there's both ConnectWise and then Gary Pika with True Methods also has a peer group that I've, I've heard good things about. Yeah. That's been a common theme we've heard yeah, over and over during our conversations is you know, peer groups and the value and how it helps drive it. And I think even one other thing, A, beyond what you're saying there is you start finding your culture matches too during that process, yeah, yeah. which yeah. you know goes beyond the tech stack and probably the most important part in a good transition. Yeah, and I know that um, you know if you're not ConnectWise and you're more Autotask, I know Steve Alexander at MSP Ignite has a good peer group uh, model over there, mm -hmm. and uh, Sean Walsh with Encore has a good peer group model for, as well. Just you know, for people if they're not in ConnectWise and they want to go to a different one, uh, you know, there's there's several really good ones out there yeah. that are MSP focused. Yeah, there there really are. There's more and more starting to pop up, uh, and and I think a lot of uh, Abe, I think it goes back to a lot of what you were just saying. I mean, the OML within the MSP community as as a whole, it's just rising. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've seen it's it's pretty rare that Rob and I, because you know, Rob and I talk to a lot of MSPs, just like Brian does. It's pretty rare that we talk to an MSP this year, and they're like, "Yeah, I really took a downturn with COVID." Like, if if we hear that, it's an immediate red flag, personally. Um, because we have we have we have so many examples of MSPs that have they've thrived to yeah. maybe not the project work, maybe not yeah. if you're break fix, but the MRR, especially around security, it's just been it's gone, it's gone it's gone crazy this year yeah. in a, in yeah. a good way for the MSP industry. You're exactly right, Tim. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked a little bit about kind of peer groups. What are some other steps an MSP can take in order to? prepare themselves for that eventual exit. Yeah, so item number two, um, or kind of idea or advice number two is benchmarking uh, with service leadership with Paul Dipple. And I don't, I, you know, I would say most of the successful companies at one point in their growth have benchmarked. They may not perpetually benchmark, but they've at least done it for, you know, for a, several iterations. 
Um, so I think that's key just to, you know, compare yourself to to others and kind of get a sense as to what your operational maturity level is. That's number two. Number three, um, I would say be open to selling uh, several years prior to retirement. So I'm, I, I kind of, um, you know, when somebody tells me, oh, I just need to get this much more sales or this much yeah. more EBITDA and I'll be ready to sell. And they really miss it because um, the private equity group investor, kind of one of the main ways where liquidity, they really want um, the founder CEO to be with them during their investment horizon, kind of that five year period. And they don't want to, the, the PE group that raised 500 million, making 10 different investments, 50 each, they're not gonna run all 10 businesses. They want the founder and CEO running it and they'll be on the board and kind of coach and give money. Um, but if you wanna retire, you know, three to five years from now, uh, you want to do your first kind of liquidity event with this investor three to five years. And um, not that they'll necessarily be an earn out, but you can um, roll equity, which is something, which is another one of my kind of pieces of advice. Uh, number, th number three, um, you know, being open to, it's really my number five, um, but being open to rolling equity uh, for a second bite at the apple, many um, many MSPs that are successful will, in the first transaction when they become PE backed, will sell uh, 60, 70, 80 percent, even 90 percent of their shares to the private equity group. But the rollover equity, um, I had a situation um, not relatively recently where the seller rolled three million dollars. And instead of it costing um, or, or roll 10%, which was 3 million, which you think would be 3 million, because the private equity group is able to um, put leverage on the business, it only cost a million eight for basically to roll that 10%, which otherwise you think would have been 3 million. So you can very efficiently roll um, equity in, a, in this, you know, uh, efficient because of the use, the use of leverage. Um, and that second bite at the apple, if you're partnered with the private equity group and we're helping you buy five MSPs um, of your size or equal, and then we're going to have another liquidity event, you know, five years down the line, the multiple of EBITDA you're going to get uh, on the, those shares that you rolled is, you know, it, we've had, you know, multiple situations where the second bite at the apple um, that the MSP kind of founder owner or other type of business um, had is in excess of what um, they got in the first launch from the private equity group. Yeah, you could see that being a huge opportunity where all of a sudden 10% of the second piece is far, um, far more valuable than 100% of the smaller pie that you had when you got started and yeah. I've heard that story a couple times especially in the software space um you know where that's happened as well and it's really interesting to to think about it that way because I think a lot of owners do really have that focus of I want to sell take my money and go to Tahiti right yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're really missing out plus you have resources at your disposal that you didn't have during that that earn out or not earn out time as you had indicated but that second swatch that really were the things that prohibited you from doing things you wanted to in the first go round. Right. You know, all of a sudden you've got money to invest. You've got resources in terms of people. You're not one guy short. You're one guy heavy, right? To to make that growth trajectory. Yeah. So. You're exactly right, Brian. Yeah, and that really brings into the kind of the fifth piece of advice, which is um, kind of back to the peer groups. Be open to merging with peer group members and other MSPs that you think. Uh, you know, have really figured it out, have a high operational maturity level. Um, two of the four PE backed platforms that we birthed this year uh, um, had two MSP peer group members coming together to get to become large enough from an EBITDA perspective for the PE group to be able to invest. Um, so have, have, in addition to participating in peer groups, have your eyes and ears open for 
potential partners that you'd like to your you know kind of your business plus another um, geographically desirable MSP business put together um, is more marketable uh, to private equity groups likely than on a standalone basis. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes sure sense. Does it matter? Have you found? I can't imagine it would, but uh, have you found that it matters if they're close to each other, far away from each other? There's definitely a bias towards um, being in the same region. So for some of the I PE can see that. Yeah. That will um, that some of the PE backed um, MSPs that that we work with on the buy side will take ten states um, and surround it kind of. You want within a lot of times people are looking for other MSPs within a car drive. Yeah, um, so sure. yeah. makes sense. Hey, hey, I got another question. You know, so yeah. we, we break out territories into like an A, B, and C, like a New York City type uh, territory, a Hartford, yeah. Connecticut size territory, and then kind of the rural, like the smaller ones. Uh, does it pay to like be in the A tier? For this, are you know, is it? Are you in trouble if you're in the C tier? Like, how is it with the M and A as far as you know the the middle and, and lower tiered cities where there's just not as much competition, or is competition good uh, when you guys are looking to purchase? That's a great great question, Rob. And I see, which is backed by Clearlight that we helped um, do this year, is headquartered in um, Endicott, and they um, they've been really successful because the cost of their, um, you know, cost of service, kind of their technical people that that they have supporting their their customers and clients. Um, it's less expensive for from a workforce perspective to have employees there uh, mm. in outside of major markets, mm. and and then they're working and they can sell into major markets, but they also kind of dominate in their in the. You know, kind of second, third tier, from a size perspective, markets. So the real, the real competitive advantage there is, um, you know, is your cost of labor versus somebody that's in New York City uh, okay. has a very high cost of labor if that's where yeah. they're. Oh, they're yeah. Yeah. So the investors just love that they love this investment with, you know, somebody being dominant in outside of major areas because of their cost. And their ability to serve larger markets from that less expensive area. That's smart. Wow. Yeah. So hey, we're kind of running near the uh, the end of time. Maybe you can share with us a little sure. bit some predictions that you got for 2021 and where you think the market's headed. Yeah. So for 2021, um, prediction number one: the MSPs, I'll call them first generation MSPs, form between two thousand MSP platforms mm -hmm. form the between 2014 and 17 are going to begin to sell and consolidate. So you think about the Cortelligence of the world, um, Thrive and Tiva. Um, there's about seven that we, you know, seven we think are, are candidates at this point. Um, and all of their goals is to kind of get to 15 million of EBITDA. There's another um, tier of private equity groups that want that kind of size of, of platform. Um, so that, that's kind of prediction number one is we're going to start to see consolidation of the platforms that are five plus years old. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, I, I think the, I, I think the, from an M&A advisor perspective, the M&A advisors that are going to be relevant are really the ones like us that just are going to roll our sleeves up and work on the buy side on um, bolt-on transactions for the MSP platforms. So we, we're going to work on five um, buy-side assignments this coming year, 10, 10 states each focused. Um, and then we're probably going, you know, if, if we things continue, which I, if, you know, I can already see here in December, um, we'll, we'll help birth another, be a catalyst for another four to five um, PE-backed platforms in 2021. Um, so just kind of all three areas of the market very active from the bolt on selling to the PE back platforms. Um, another five platforms created. There's 41 MSP PE back platforms right now um, in the US. And, you know, I'd, I'd anticipate another 10 or so, another 10 or so being, um, 
you know, created and half of those being created by Focus in 2021. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's Amazing. impressive. I had no idea that there was that many going on right now. There's yeah, I didn't either. One across the world, yeah, and in, in the low 40s wow. that we bring bolt-on targets to all the time. Sheesh. <laughs> I had no clue. Okay. I mean, I knew yeah. it was. I knew we were in a very heavy M and A market, but I didn't know that like there was so much, like you know, PE money and groups going and doing this. That's they, that's nuts. Yeah, I've I have PE groups that are, um, you know, they and they can't find assets in the two to yeah. five million dollar EBITDA range. So many of them have been taken, um, and I I mean I've I've got five. Um, PE groups right now that are, you know, I'm on a hunt for a platform for them. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so there's okay. de definitely the capital is not um, drying up at all. Wow. That's awesome. Very interesting. It's great to hear from the market. Yeah, it is. So, it is. <clears throat> so with that, I think uh, it's time for the speed round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, uh, so I'm not sure if you've heard any of our podcasts yet, but we just do five quick questions, just one word answers at the end. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'm the first fine. one is talk, text, or Teams? Teams, 100%. Yep. I live on yep. Teams. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yep. As, as we all do. Uh, music, movies, or TV? Uh, music. Um, I'm a cellist. I started playing cello at age five. And I'm awesome. um, pretty pretty auditory very cool. yeah very cool uh what age do you want to retire i will never retire i'm every i work i i love what i do it's not work and i i mean if i could work until the end of time i'll i'll in msp m a i would do it no desire uh, favorite to answer yeah. <laughs> no uh all right so retire. next one yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, Mac or Windows? Um, Windows, I just think it's more um, prevalent and easy, there's less frictional um, friction in, with communication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so last one, if there's one thing you could do outside of just being in the MSP space or just the tech space, what would it be? Find ways to be a better dad to my son, uh, who's 11, Andrew. Being a dad is yeah. the most important thing in the world to me. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Good answer. Well, Abe, I, I All right, really Rob, you want to take us home? Yeah, yeah, Abe, I really appreciate it. It's a very insightful. Uh, you clearly have a head on your shoulders there, man, and you know what you're talking about. Um, oh, for anybody thanks. that is looking to get in touch with Abe, uh, we're going to be including his LinkedIn profile with the podcast. Uh, remember also that this episode will be on mspbusinessschool.com and anywhere you get your podcast to include YouTube. So please go over to YouTube, uh, check it out, subscribe and like. We'd really appreciate it so we can bring you more of this content that we love. Um, and oh. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that, Abe, uh, any parting uh, words of wisdom for the MSPs out there? Um, I would say spend all your definitely listen to um, every one of the podcasts that uh, Rob, Tim, and Brian have done. <laughs> we'll pay you later. Uh, sure. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll yeah. Pay you later. I mean, besides that, <laughs> I, they're, you know, they've done many of them, and they're just the contents invaluable. If you're driving um you know sometime when you're you're not in the office and you can listen to a podcast it's a really great use of your time to you know to 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 dig through kind of the index of all the topics that are available thank you sir appreciate yeah. that thank, thank, you. You. thank you terrific so i guess we are all off until next week Abe. thanks again awesome thanks, good really yeah. appreciate it yeah sure. thanks for being on thanks tim speak soon